Uh, I'm Aida here, and I'm pleased to be your MC today. And I might not be the best MC you ever seen in your life, but I try my best. Uh, so, uh, on behalf of Academic Affairs and Equal Committee, I would like to uh, welcome everybody to the second event of Academic uh, Affairs and Equal Committee event. Um, entitled Formal, Informal, and Non-Formal Education. Let us begin this event with the national anthem. Uh, may I please ask everybody to rise? Thank you. And now I would like to invite um, and welcome Professor Dato Dr. Ikram Shah, Vice Chancellor of Maso University, to give us the opening speech. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon. Firstly, a warm welcome to our guest all the way from Johor, uh, Professor Dr. Sakina Sofia Baro, Director of Operation at the City, and of course our guest speaker, uh, one Ahmad Saifuddin, Managing Director of at City, uh, Prof. Ala, uh, Dr. Rani, and all the guests. We are gathered here today for our second academic transformation series brought to us by AAE and today we will listen to what formal, informal and non-formal education by our guest speaker Wan Ahmad Saifuddin, Wan Ahmad Razi, Managing Director of Adversity. Education can be gained in several forms through schools, life experiences and extracurricular activities. Education has no specifications or boundaries assigned to it. Therefore, it can be broadly classified under three categories, formal education, informal education, and non-formal education. This I just Googled this morning and didn't know what it was because this. Formal education is followed in schools, colleges, and other courses that follow a specific type of coursework. Informal education, on the other hand, is a type of knowledge that one gains through several life experiences. This knowledge can be the one that we obtain from our parents and elders, Individual necessary skills of life that are important for survival and sustenance comes under this category. And finally, non-formal education is one that is framed according to the requirement of a particular job. Today, we're going to learn how these three forms of education amalgamate into giving learners a fully holistic experience based on the importance of each types. As our first talk was about education 4.0, 
Now, I hope you can still remember Education 4.0. We now extend the knowledge gathered from that lecture into today's topic. And I hope everyone present here and online will fully utilize the information from these talks to assist in your personal approach in academic. Thank you to the AA committee for putting this event together. And thank you all, you all for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ikram. Now I would like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Veronica Chua, Senior Director Academics, to give us her welcoming address uh, and also introduction to today's topic and speaking. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to our honorable guest, our distinguished invited speaker, Mr. Wan Ahmad Saifuddin, Wan Ahmad Razi, the Managing Director of EduCT, Iskandar Malaysia and Grand Bahad. Professor Datuk Dr. Ikram Shah, Vice Chancellor of Masa University. Prof Associate Professor Kasawa Rao Ala, Education Vertical COO, Group Senior Director, Group Directors, deans and fellow academicians. I am delighted to welcome everyone to yet another academic transformation series activity organized by the AAE Committee of Masa University in 2022. Today's event is aimed at updating us on the concepts of formal, non-formal and informal education and its applications as well as integration in the reframe education landscape, that is Education 4.0. The most fundamental classification of types of education is formal, non-formal, and informal. From this, other more complex and abstract classification emerge. For example, open learning and distance learning are derivatives of non-formal education. Formal education, as traditionally offered in universities, has its limitations and seems to be increasingly unable to meet the needs of individuals and society. In response, non-formal and informal elements are being gradually incorporated into formal education to address the changing needs of learners and employers. Therefore, as we work together on the academic transformation at Masa University, it is essential for us to have an update perspective of these concepts and to help us understand this better, we have with us a renowned leader in education who is shaping education redesign in Malaysia. A little background on our distinguished speaker today. Mr. Wan Ahmad Saifuddin, has had extensive experience in education, e-business, management consultation, consulting, as well as corporate transformation. As entrepreneur, head of unit, project leader, senior management and CEO. He has built up a strong reputation in the field of education, e-learning and knowledge management, having set up an e-learning company for Petronas from ground up. He also headed the education unit in Kazana and was responsible for the Trust School Program, the PPP Public School Transformation Program with the Ministry of Education Malaysia, and is also a founding board of trustees member for Teach for Malaysia. After joining Equity National Berhad and assisting in several acquisition of education assets, he was subsequently appointed as the CEO of Unita Capital and Grand Berhad, the management company of Unita International University. He was also responsible setting up and playing the role of acting CEO and Chief Transformation Officer of Mara Corporation and Grand Berhad. Prior to joining Edu City Iskandar as Managing Director in 2019, he was the Executive Vice President of Special Projects, Iskandar Investment Berhad, IIB, focusing on, on the corporate transformation of the IIB group of companies 
as well as its digital strategy. Now, he leads Edu City Iskanda, a catalytic development driven by IIB as a fully integrated education city. Edu City Iskanda is positioned as a feeder of talents to support Iskanda Malaysia's various economic activities while grooming future generation of leaders. Partnering with world-class education institutions, Edu City Iskanda with its universities, colleges, and international schools, R&D centers, and integrated with student accommodation and recreational and sports facilities is the first of its kind in Asia. On behalf of AAE, I would like to thank Mr. Wan Ahmad for graciously taking time from his busy schedule to share his insights with us. And now, without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Wan Ahmad Saifuddin to take the stage for his presentation. Thank you, Prof. Veronica. Let us welcome the speaker of the day, Mr. Von Ahmad Saifuddin, Managing Director of Edu City, Skanda, Malaysia, to deliver his uh, insight on formal, informal, and non formal education. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon, uh, Professor Datuk Ikram, um, whom I just found out was uh, is, is a brother of, of a colleague of mine who was both in Kazana and Equinas. Very very nice to meet you, sir. Uh, Professor Dr. Allah, um, Professor Veronica, um, Datuk Rani, and and Devon, who are colleagues of mine in Unita. And ladies and gentlemen, firstly, thank you very much for coming. And uh, firstly, I'd just like to say my only qualification in education or to be in the field of education is saya ni anak cikgu. Saya, bapa saya was a teacher for nine months before he joined the civil service. Uh, mak saya, 25 years was in Convent Seremban, she was in KGV, and, and ultimately uh, in St. Mary's School until she retired. So I'm qualified as an architect, tapi, you know, along the way, I, I got into the field of education. I have taught in uh, five universities and have been on the management side. Uh, and always I gaduh dengan Professor Dr. Sakina on the academic side lah. We always, uh, have a sparring session together because I, I have certain views on education which I'd like to share with you today. So, but firstly, maybe I can uh, start with introducing EduCT. For those of you who don't know, we are the Asia's first multi campus education city. So, we're in Iskandar Putri, Joho. So, we're very close to the second link uh, to Singapore near the Tua Highway. Uh, Established in 2008, about 2.3 billion ringgit worth of uh, investments were done. 800 million by ourselves and about 1.5 billion by our partners. We have uh, about 4,000 students. Uh, almost 4,000 have already graduated from there. We have four international higher education institutions um, uh, from Singapore as well as the UK, and two local higher education institutions, schools as well as training academies. So we're in about 300 acres of land. Uh, what we do is we, we either sell or lease buildings or land to institutions to have a presence in any city. And, but we, we take care of them outside of class. So we have shared facilities, we have world-class um, uh, sporting facilities, we've got a student hub where the students can uh, lounge around. We have the education village where students can stay. And we have two complexes. There's some of the universities chose to build their own campuses. Others choose to uh, reside in the complex that we have. We have two complexes with multiple institutions. So 
some of the things that we have competitively, why do international uh, institutions house themselves in Edu City? You know, a location, I mean, we, we're very close to Singapore. We can attract, um, uh, you know, a lot of employers, a lot of uh, uh, people in Iskandar Putri itself. You may be surprised, you know, pre-pandemic, we have more than 4,000 South Koreans residing uh, in, in uh, Iskandar Putri. We have a huge Japanese community there as well which is why uh, a lot of the schools flourish uh, in uh, Iskandar Putri as well as we have them attending all the institutions that we have. We have a state-of-the-art campus. Where we're basically under Skanda Investment Berhad, which is in turn owned by Kazana National um, uh, EPF as well as a state government of Johor via KPRJ. We want to focus on the future of education, and these are, uh, we hope to organize a couple of events starting with the end of this year uh, about questioning what, where is education heading? And, and I think this is a very important question, especially in the times that we are in, where you know, people talk about deglobalization of education. Parents don't want to send the kids too far away just in case something happens. And there's a huge demand that we're seeing uh, as we are meeting other international education hubs that this is a great opportunity for universities not only to ask students to come, but for universities to go to where the students are. Uh, we have an academy as a, as a talent development center, and we have a very flexible uh, partnership models for both international and local institutions. So these are a quick look at our shared facilities. I think, I mean, you have a wonderful facility here. It's very impressive. I normally pass by quite fast in the car. I can catch a glimpse of it from the highway. And, and well, myself, Dr. Sakina, we're, we're very happy to visit you here today. But we have, uh, so those are the three shared facilities that we have. But coming soon, we have a knowledge management center, uh, which will act as a shared library for all the institutions that's uh, on campus. We are, uh, you know, we saw your fantastic uh, um, anatomical uh, machines that can slice and dice, uh, you know, the human body. Uh, we have, uh, you know, probably we're going a bit towards that direction as well by having what we call next generation digital classrooms and, and, and digital collaborative spaces. Um, we are also planning to build a sports arena together with, uh, international uh, hardware uh, PC manufacturer because there's no dedicated esports tournament center in Malaysia. So this will be the first one, inshallah. And uh, moving a bit more into AR, VR because that's something that really lends itself really well to education. Okay, and this is the, some of the things that we offer the students over there. So while the learning takes place in the institutions and while we provide them with facilities, we also do uh, a lot of content, a lot of activities that we invite uh, you know, the students to participate. We have a cross-institution education, uh, education student center. So every institution that's in education will have a student representative so that we can coordinate activities across uh, the different institutions. And yeah, that's really it. So what I'd like to probably focus on, uh, you know, I, I, Prof, I, I did not Google uh, uh, the three definitions. So I made up my own definitions, which I tend to do quite a lot. So, so how I'm going to define the three, formal, informal, and uh, informal education. So formal education, I think everybody's familiar with. I mean, we're here. We're, we're participating in an academic setting where you're moving towards a goal where you will have a certain certification that, that proves you have a certain level of capability. So, so some of the uh, uh, characteristics I would put is, uh, you know, something that leads to a certification and recognition. From a format perspective, it's an academic format, which normally in lectures, in, for you to do projects, etc. And there is a certain time boundness to it. Yeah, you have to finish within a certain period. That's a requirement. That's according to the rules. So informal education, I uh, I put it more towards what do you do outside the classroom, maybe still in the institution, 
So maybe, you know, you do your study visits, you do your seminars, you do your forums, conferences, typically, with some semblance of structure. So I, I call it, although it's informal, but there is a little bit of, of structure, uh, which all those things I just mentioned uh, would have. You know, maybe even uh, participation in clubs and, soci uh, in, and societies, which has some level of structure. So, but today, what what will you call formal education? Um, I, 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 Prof. Veronica, my, my definition of, of uh, for example, e-learning, MOOCs and distance learning, I will put more under formal because it is has the same sort of format, have the same form of structure, it's just that your medium is a little bit different. So informal education, I would say, you know, how, how, how do your kids learn? Uh, my kids learn through YouTube videos. You know, my eldest can cook uh, carbonara from scratch. How? Because he learned it on YouTube. You know, my kids can do, uh, you know, they're, they're really, since the Food Channel appeared on Astro, they've, they've been really experimenting. You know, me and my wife are the experimenters, I suppose. Yeah, we're, we're, we're the guinea pigs. But you pick up skills that you otherwise wouldn't have. I mean, when, when I was studying, there was no Google. You still had to use library cards and uh, things like that. And then the next generation went on to Google, but now people learn visually. People go on to videos. So YouTube videos, things like Reddits and subreddits, uh, knowledge stacks, uh, or the, if you're part of the e uh, early internet, as I was, uh, you go to discussion forums. You know, if you had a question, uh, and, and most forums are international. If you had a question, I, I, was, I was actually learning how to do web design, uh, HTML programming on my own. So when I face a problem, I go to a discussion forum, post a question at night, go to sleep. By the time I wake up, I will have about 20 different answers. You know, so there's a whole community that is actively participating in this knowledge. You know, not really structured. You know, there's a semi-structure to it. There's a moderator. Uh, you know, to make sure that things are still on point within the scope of that discussion forum. So this second type of informal education, I would call it the knowledge exploration and discussion, and it's more in informal time bound. You, you, there is a certain time boundness to it, but it's not strictly, you know, uh, you, don't, you don't define it up front. But a certain discussion when it's gone through enough depth, and then you say, okay, that's, that's enough. Let's start another thread. Let's start another group. Let's start another uh, topic of discussion. So the way I define informal education is what I call the participation of society. In, you know, there's a, the famous saying that it takes a village to raise a child. You know, what, what sort of ethics? Where do you learn ethics? Where do you learn values where do you learn morality so things like that tends to not be in any sort of formal setting you know if when you have civics class or a formal setting everybody falls asleep and starts you know playing games but the informal setting where you you experience this and you usually you learn by seeing you learn by observing you learn by mimicking yeah so so, so this is how i define uh, informal education so this is a relationship between parents and children, you know, extended families, peers, colleagues, uh, which includes also a, a, a huge factor of education, which is sometimes available in formal and informal, but sometimes not, which is the aspect of moral support. I think during this pandemic, we, we noticed that mental health is a recognized issue. But was mental health not present prior to pandemic? Of course it was. It was just not visible. So when, when you go into the field of education, you know, having this mental support, this moral support, this, uh, you know, this unspoken or unwritten sort of support is a major contribution. And, and I will uh, illustrate this in one example a little later. So when we talk about education, the, the, the the question is always, how does this relate to the next stage? The question that I ask, I like to ask educators is, five minutes after you graduate, when do you take your next exam? You are evaluated 
via exams, via assignments. Five minutes once you step out of the institution, how are you being evaluated? And this is, this is where this dichotomy uh, happens. And you, you sometimes, uh, you know, you hear industry complaining, oh, academics are not preparing. Uh, you know, the students for the industry, the academics will say, well, industry is also not participating in, in uh, meaningfully having that dialogue, which is, I think, a problem that needs to be resolved Has the effort has to come from both sides. So, uh, okay, that's number one. Second is, what is the relationship between knowledge and competency? Knowledge is what you know, competency is what you can do. Once you go into the, they are a bit is yes, what you know, but a lot is what can you do? You know, you have to prove yourself. We are now in EDUCT, we just finished our performance, you know, our annual, annual performance evaluation. So the main thing we ask, so what did you achieve? What did you show? And, you know, at the lower levels, you can take into account input. But at the higher levels, you have to uh, uh, judge them more on output. What do you achieve as opposed to what do you do? Yeah. So this, if people are being evaluated in that way five minutes after they leave the institution, why don't we pull a bit of that back into the, uh, you know, into the academic setting? Why don't we push a bit of what is uh, being looked from the academic perspective into the industrial setting. You know, you have Bloom's taxonomy, uh, you have your pedagogical approaches, but once you go into world of work, it's the Kirkpatrick model. You know, uh, how, how can you uh, show what you can do? So this dichotomy needs to be met. This dichotomy needs to be addressed. And, and there's a couple of things that we're trying. I, I don't think there's a silver bullet out there. But I think there has to be efforts to to bridge this uh, bridge this gap. And then we have the reality of today. I mean, the world is changing. We have a lot of people who lost their jobs. We have rampant unemployment, made worse by the pandemic. Joho especially feels it when the borders with Singapore were closed. Normally, every day, 300,000 people travel from Johor to Singapore and come back. And suddenly, they couldn't. About 100,000 decided to stay in Singapore, you know, really crank conditions just so that they can earn money. But 200,000 didn't or couldn't. So what do you do in this situation? And then, uh, that's one. Secondly, you see... Yeah, now, the difference in workplaces to do online meetings before the pandemic, everybody said, huh? Online meetings. Serious, yeah. yeah. It's like video conference was so difficult. But today, it's bread and butter. You know, Zoom, Teams, Hangout, uh, uh, Google Meet has suddenly become part of your normal diet. Sampai orang dah meluat dah, dah penat dah. You know, you get screen fatigue. Last time, at least when you come to office, or at least now when we're back to office, you got time between meetings. Now they said, okay, meeting finish at 4, 401, next meeting starts. So you have a lot of screen fatigue, you have a lot of uh, stress. You get a lot of stress. So the world is changing. And, but there are what I call counter-psychical or counter-intuitive things happening. Number one, what we notice with our institutions is in 2021, enrollment numbers all went up. Uh, Newcastle University of Medicine, Malaysia, uh, went up by about 30% enrollments. One of the reasons what we felt was because students couldn't travel overseas to do medicine. So, you know, a lot of them stayed back. Also, international students were allowed in. So it, it rose. Uh, Netherlands Maritime uh, University College almost doubled their intake. Eh, macam mana ni? What's happening? Because we thought orang tak nak pergi belajar because people don't want to go, go out. But people, are, I think, sometimes they're tired of having this on-screen interaction. They, 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 
the uh, desire to have the interaction with their friends. They want to meet people. They want to go to a classroom. They want to you know, have that social life as well, which is very much an aspect of education. And then, uh, like I mentioned, online meetings, we, we noticed productivity actually could increase. Actually, sometimes actually got more done, but people got stressed out more at the same time. And one thing that we cannot deny is the adoption of uh, uh, digital platforms has accelerated beyond anybody's wild, wildest dreams. I mean, Zoom was a very small company before the pandemic, and now they are the leading platform provider. You know, big companies like Microsoft and Google couldn't even catch up to a company from China uh, called, uh, who has a product called Zoom. So it is a, a very much of a leveling and a rethinking of the playing field. So what should we do? Add to that, several companies decided to give uh, uh, full work from home options because you know, in, in US, you hear of the phenomena of the great resignation. So many people resign. Why? Because the companies insist they come back to office. They said, no, we, we, you know, we were comfortable with work from home. It seems to work. And then, uh, uh, and they, they're finding they're losing people. Uh, you know, top, uh, the big four companies, uh, uh, you know, uh, the big four in accounting have, have uh, some of them have already allowed um, work from home option. So we're in a very much in a different world. We're in a very much where, okay, we talk about academic and industry. Uh, sometimes there's a mismatch. We talk about the different landscape. So what do we do uh, moving forward? So I think as now, uh, I think Prof. Allah also uh, mentioned, uh, sekarang we, we have a, a uh, sort of uh, certain capacity again of students can come back. It's mixed. Some you have to do online, some you have to uh, attend class. So I think we have to start believing that, you know, there has to be a mix of how we do things, which also has to be a mix of your formal, informal and informal learning. And how do you take advantage of that? So what we've done at UCT, so one of the programs that, that, that we um, implemented is we called it Parantis Iskandar. Parantis, why, uh, why is that program important? Is to address the, the unemployment in Johor particularly uh, due to the, you know, the number of jobs uh, that from Singapore that suddenly did not become available. So how do we approach this? So industry says, okay, I've, I've got actually a lot of jobs, but I don't have the right people. And we always hear this from companies. Jobs are there, don't have the right people. So how do you bridge that gap? So uh, what we did is we said, okay, here's a program where industry have to put, put your money where your mouth is. Lah. Okay, You have to give a job offer right from the beginning, a conditional job offer, a letter on the table, then I will assist you in finding the people that you want. Okay, so we have a uh, certain criteria. The the interviews has to be done by together with the companies. You have to pick the person and say yes, this is the right person. We're working with talent corporation as a uh, to for as to supply us with a profiling tool to understand what sort of psychometric uh, behavior and whether there's a fit of that person into the company. But then you have to put money where your mouth is. You have to give a job offer from day one, okay? Conditional. That means they have to go through the training, etc., and and do well enough. So that is a skin of the teeth of industry. At the same time, uh, you know, we we offer the, the the unemployed. Here's an opportunity. You have to sign a contract with us as well. So there is a certain level of responsibility. Uh, and then we sign a contract with the training provider to complete the loop. So you will attend between one month to three months of training and you are guaranteed, if you perform, 12 months of uh, employment. So you can, this is one sense where, you know, normally uh, you have an internship program and you have an apprenticeship program. Internship program is where uh, you've got to spend three to six months in a company 
most of the time you get really, really good at two things. Making coffee. And you know how to use the photocopy machine. Lah. Do a, do a copy. Yeah. That's a normal thing. Everybody goes through that. But that's not meaningful. Then there's the apprenticeship model where your time in the company is actually used to evaluate your academic performance. So it's closely tied, it's extremely structured. And, and this is where we look at the German model uh, and the Australian model of TVET, etc. So those are existing models of where you have all three kinds of learning together. So what other models are there? So I'm, I'm trained as an architect. So I, I uh, started first year in 1988. I graduated in 1991. I still think architectural education is a model for future of learning. Why? When I wanted to take a course, I didn't know what course to take. Uh, I like physics. I like math. But I, I like art as well. So I like both sides. I like the arts. I like the sciences. So when I look through uh, the applications in terms of subject matter, the only course that turned out was architecture. And when I was a student of architecture, year one to year three, half of my subjects were science. You know, you have environmental science, you have structures, uh, you have certain uh, aspects of engineering, civil engineering, and you have to do theory, philosophy, history. You know, two extremes, if you like, but it actually has to come together. I always say that the most difficult job in the world is being an architect. Why? You have to take an idea in somebody's mind, turn it into buildable drawings, build it, and they have to like experiencing it. That's a tough job, you know, because it's a very subjective thing, right? How do you take an idea or parts of idea, and sometimes your client don't know what they want. They want 20 different things, which doesn't make sense. So you got to pick the right things and, and put them together. So in architectural education, after third year, you have to do one year practical. You have to do one year uh, attachment in a company before you can do part two. So to get your part one uh, qualification, you have to work. And in that one year, you're not... Uh, I did a lot of photocopying. Uh, we didn't really like coffee, so it was more data area. But you were given responsibility. I actually had to lead a team of people to manage a hotel project. So civil engineers, mechanical engineers, structural engineers were all looking at me for instruction. You need grad, baru grad lagi ni. So it was terrifying, it was exhilarating at the same time, but it put you in a position of responsibility and you know it's something that you have to take for. And then you go back to another two years of education. Why, why do I mention this model? It's because this is where one of the models that I know and I understand and where I have gone through, which gives you real life exposure into work for a significant amount of time. Three to six months is actually very short. You know, if you look at management trainee programs where they uh, rotate you in, in different functions over a certain period of time, to give you exposure to different aspects. It's good for you to discover what sort of work is actually, um, you know, you, you, you are amenable to. But do you get solid work done? Do you get depth and do you get experience? That takes about a year. So the Parantis program was meant to uh, address the un un unemployment. So we're in the midst of setting up a new college called Edusky International College, not to compete with our partners, but to do something totally different. So we said, okay, how do we bridge this industry academia? There are, you know, both, both sides have very, very valid points and both sides have, you know, valid arguments. So we said, okay, uh, I was a lecturer in, uh, uh, in 19, okay, this probably shows my age, 1996, I was lecturing in an design school. And in that design school, 60% of the 
of the lecturers were from industry. 40% were full-time academics. And we found that to be a very interesting mix. With the students actually, because you did first year, second year, third year, you go to Australia. So when you, they went to Australia, three out of top five is always our students, not the Australians. And we found that that mix, if you have the right mix of industry and the right mix of academia, you know, the, you can get the formula right. The outcome can be the right outcome. So that's what we're trying to do with our new college. So we're saying, okay, we're not going to compete with people out there. All we want to do is, can we pull the all the training materials from industry, MQA nice it, and get industry to teach. Yeah. And then we fill in the gaps because industry, orang industry tak semestinya pandai mengajar. Yeah. They can talk lah. But sometimes you don't know what point they're making lah. You know, you, you don't know how to do assessment. You know, assessments is a huge thing. Is, uh, how do I set exam question? How do I do this, etc. They don't know. You know, that, which is a point which always interests me. You know, for you to be a teacher in a class, when I did teach for Malaysia, when you, you, for you to appear in front of the class, you have to be a licensed teacher. You have to minimum have a PGDE and postgraduate diploma in education. Then you can appear in front of a class. In universities, when I started, they said, they look at your degree. Okay, you, you got the job. I said, eh, okay, I've never taught before. It's okay, you pick it up along the way. So when, and Dr. Sakina is very, very familiar with this. I am extremely, extremely particular on your pedagogical approach. How are you going to teach? You know, because you know, when you teach, you can see from the eyes of students whether they can follow or not. Yeah, some of them blank out, some of them sketching, some of them tengah ini. You know, you know whether they're paying attention, you know whether actually learning is taking place. So how do you do assessments? How do you teach in a way that students learn? So this is a constant uh, question. You know, I, I landed uh, on a methodology which I was or pedagogical approach I was comfortable with, which is social constructivism. At least you get the students to construct the knowledge, you know, whether you are Vygotsky camp or Piaget or whichever approach. So you have to have a methodology and you have to get the students to create and understand the knowledge themselves. Then it sticks, you know. So there's many, many theories. I think, you know, some uh, more valid than others when it comes to certain kinds of knowledge, you have to pick the right sort of approach, you have to pick the right sort of format. But in the end, what's important is, you know, can that knowledge be shown to have come from you? And can you do the work if you're in the place of work? Yeah. That's why I keep coming back to the performance management. How do you evaluate a person in employment? Did you meet your KPIs? Did you show the right character to do it? You know, normally uh, in most, I've been, uh, this is my 13th company actually that I'm working for, which is not necessarily a batch of honor, um, but I've worked in many companies and I've seen how they evaluate people. You know, you have your core KPIs, you have your competencies and you have your core values, you know, and that makes up your performance. So yes, you have certain goals and targets to meet, but it's how you meet them is also very important. I mean, you can langgar aja lah, kan? Don't care, no survivor, as long as I meet my KPI. I've been in very toxic environments where that was the case. All they want to do is with their KPI. You know, anything outside KPI? Oh, no, my job. That's toxic. That's toxic. So when, when my approach to performance management is that you can, you know, we always have mid-year reviews and even year-end reviews where KPIs can be uh, adjusted because, I mean, seriously, in the world of work, which goal ever stays the same for 12 months? Jarang, kan? You will, you will have me suddenly, your boss datang, eh, ada project baru lah. Alamak, not my KPI. <laughs> Nanti nobody wants to do work. So, we, I mean, all these tools have to be used in a way that has an outcome. All these tools have to be used in a way that you can show, you know, this is how I'm moving towards what the organization wants to go through. So, I mean, those, those are some of the sharing and, and I'd, I'd love to hear questions 
uh, I know it's a bit of a hodgepodge thing, but this is how I view education, something I'm very passionate about. Uh, uh, I my, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a child of two educators. Um, and, and I think uh, in all of the 13 jobs that I've been in, nothing is as rewarding as actually teaching. You know, as an architect, I have to wait about two years before I can see a result. You know, the building comes up, etc. When you teach, it takes just one semester to see a difference in a student. And that change that you make can change somebody's world. And I think that's why a lot of us do it. So I hope uh, you have gained something from it. I'm, and I would, uh, you know, be interested to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Von Ahmed, for your valuable insight. We definitely have so many questions. Um, I would like to invite, uh, I would like to open the floor for Q&A session. And I would like to ask uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Gopal, Director of ECO, to moderate this session. Uh, Hey, good evening to all. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wan Ahmad Saifuddin. It's a very knowledgeable sharing of formal and informal and uh, <laughs> informal education, how it is interlinked to each other, and uh, of your experience and uh, what you are uh, shared with us on the ethics and values, how you are getting, and even you are uh, uh, talking about the mental health uh, importance. As an academic transformation in Massa, now, right now, we are uh, looking into it, the mental health, and we have included a, one of a compulsory module or subject in our curriculum. So, hope uh, your sharing of experience is helpful for our academicians. Okay, any questions from the flow? So, how it this formal and informal and informal is going to help us? And uh, he has uh, rightly pointed out the uh, point out the information that the academician, the gap between the academic and the industry, how to link. Uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Anthony, uh, this mic. Sorry, just to understand how much time do we have? Say, I, I'm I'm conscious. I don't want to take too much of the time. Uh, can be ten minutes. Okay, okay sure. Yeah, how uh, university is playing major role in non-formal learning? And can you please give an example for it? How universities can play a role in non-formal learning? Okay, first I have to relook at my definition. <laughs> so non-formal, I take it as informal. Uh, okay. uh, so I'll tell you what we're doing in EduCT. Um, uh, uh, let me tell you a little story. Uh, uh, you don't have to stand like so you can sit down if you want. <laughs> Thank you, thank you for the question. I went to this university in the north, and uh, I met, you know, it's a fantastic campus, uh, very nice place. So, wow, you know, lots of international students, etc. And then I met a friend of mine who I haven't seen for 20 years. So we had uh, uh, outside. So I asked, well, you know, this is a fantastic university. How, how does it contribute to society? I mean, how, how, what do the people who's living around it feel about it? And the response I got was, we don't know. Because it's like a wall around it. The students don't come talk to us. Uh, it's as if this alien suddenly beamed down and appeared there. You know? And then, but we don't interact. We don't interact. We don't know who's here. We don't know this. And this is coming from people who are living very close by. So I think this is where education institutions have to play an important role. You are never an island. You are never just on your own. What you do, I mean, uh, EduCT was started in uh, Iskandar Putri as a catalytic uh, development. It's meant to affect things around. And if you are in real estate development, you know that the best way to make shops work is to either open a school or to open a college close to it. Why? Because 
in no other instance can you bring high number of people into an area and when you as a retailer when you want to make a living you need constant you know you need constant traffic so education as an industry has a role to play in from an architectural perspective i call it urban design lah it's, it's part of the fabric of the place where you are at so when i first joined IDCT, i asked you know where in iskanda putri there's glang patah around it there's bukit indah around it there's perling around it what have we done with them why why are you doing so many things with people far away you are ignoring the neighborhoods around you you know okay we've done some stuff with uh, sungai melayu we've done some stuff with pendas etc so i think you know i i i i truly believe that the noblest of profession is education because you have a knock-on effect for generations sometimes but it's not just a student it's not just the people in the classroom do the people around you feel a positive impact or not you know do they feel wow i'm so grateful this institution is here you know they're helping me doing this without them i wouldn't have done this so that's a societal that's to me the informal aspect and the societal responsibility of on one side the institution's responsibility to the community and an opportunity for the students to experience the informal which is the community societal moral and ethical uh, dimension yeah so a university I think has to do that. I mean, look at uh, how India is as a country and how it has benefited from having uh, the captains of industry in, of Indians in US. You know, now you name the top tech companies, they're all headed by Indians. Yeah. Google, Twitter, you know, and many, many others, Microsoft. Uh, and, 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 but they don't just live and contribute in US, they bring back their knowledge, they bring back their expertise, they bring back business back to India as well. So that's that longer arm of a reach that you can do. So I, I, I have the saying when, when I look from an economic perspective, I say China is a country that succeeds because of government. India is a country that succeeds in spite of government. It's because industry does the work. Industry is the one that reaches out. And, and you know, that is that, if you like, that informal link and that informal um, role that I think that institutions, universities uh, have, uh, you know, to the place around them. I, I visited two years ago the first university in the world, in Morocco, in Fez, you know. And you wouldn't know it was a university. You just walked past there's a door. It's so integrated into the whole fabric of the city, the wall city of Fez, that you don't see it, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to be so noticeable. But when you go in, it's fantastic. There's people just sitting around listening. There's ladies teaching men. There's uh, little kids at the back, you know, one of the mosques, uh, you know, we're, we're so used to Smayang uh, Jumat here in, in Malaysia. It's like, oh, okay, kids, keep quiet, whatever, everything. In Fez, I go to a mosque during uh, uh, Friday prayers. There's a huge space for mothers and children. You know, one third of the mosque is dedicated to mothers and children. What does that tell you about the mosque role in society? And, you know, it's the same thing with the university. You cannot be a wall garden where you only have things happening within the walls. You have, your walls have to be permeable. You have to leak out into society and let society leak in. You have to have an osmosis relationship between uh, community, you know, because you are a microcosm, uh, the, the, the core word of university, you are a microcosm of the universe. You are where you can pull all the knowledge and learning takes place there, but your role is to go back out into the universe and contribute. So that's my sort of take on that. I hope I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, Prof.
Thank you, Mr. Wan, for the inspiring talk. Uh, I would like to, uh, maybe you like to sh uh, share your experience, uh, we as educationists, and um, as the saying goes that uh, learning only takes place when the change of behavior, right? That's what people say. Okay. Learning only takes place, okay, when there's a change of behavior. Maybe from your reflection, your best experience that you would like to share, how you educate and take this uh, change of behavior on your students. Thank you. Okay, that's just about the quest toughest question in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this. How do you change behavior of your kids? Kan? Zaman dulu okey lah, rotan je. Senang. Kita semua tak payah orang pegang rotan, pandang je dah menangis lah. But we live in a different world today. You know. Um, I don't think learning takes place only when there's a change of behaviour. Change of behaviour takes place when learning has been done. Because it's not just the learning, it's the impact of that learning and and whether it it comes here or not lah. Yeah. Because there's learning here. But behaviour only comes when you touch here. You know, it's when you inspire, when you uh, stretch people, when you, uh, you know. When, when I was uh, lecturing in my first uh, lecturing job, I'm not proudest of the really good students. Because the really good students, without me also, they're going to be really good. Lah. I'm proudest of the ones that I achieved the Delta. The ones that when they first come to my class was about 45, 50 marks. Lah. But when they leave my class, they're about 75. And I met some of those students and they are now teaching other people. And that is such a pleasure to know that, you know, he said, you changed me. Yeah. And I think that's what educators strive for. Change in behavior uh, okay, yesterday uh, we were having our uh, strategic, uh, strategic retreat at the IIB group of companies and we talked about culture change. Culture change is the hardest thing in the world to achieve. All that leaders can do is, are you building an environment that allows for change? You can't bring a horse to water, but you can't make drink but are you creating an environment where they can challenge you are you creating an environment where they are they don't be afraid to speak up you know that doesn't mean that okay la, you are tomorrow you start becoming a hippie everything can you know you want to sniff your markers also can uh, no it is whether you are giving people room to breathe and whether you have instilled enough trust that they are comfortable to ask you that question. And there are instances that I can tell you where not even five years ago, 10 years ago, in a lecture theater at a master's class, Somebody asked a question that challenged the lecturer and the lecturer answered, you can't ask. That's how you kill education. I think one of the things, you know, just sharing as an, uh, as an educator, the first thing that educators have to be comfortable is to say three words. I don't know. And it's okay. Consultants don't know everything all the time, but they still make money, right? That's why they call consultants. And because when you ask a question, their reply is, that's a very good question, let me get back to you. That's what consultants do. Yeah, they, they don't have to answer all the time. They just come back and come back with something that sounds really nice. I, I was a consultant for five years, so I know. Uh, but can, and it's okay, and I think if educators show 
a little bit level of vulnerability to say, oh, I'm not sure about that. Let me look it up and I'll come back to you. It's fine. Because when you set the environment for learning to take place, then learning will take place. That may lead to a change in knowledge, competency and behavior. Behavior is the, the toughest one. That's why you hear a lot of industry leaders now say, now they say, I hire not on skills and knowledge, I hire on attitude. You can teach a person skill, you can give a person knowledge, but it's really, really tough to change somebody's attitude. I have done a lot of corporate transformation where I had to let a lot of people go. And it's really, really tough. It's really tough when you walk into the near the water cooler or the coffee machine, nobody wants to look at you. You're the bad guy. But tough things have to be done. But the main thing is once you've done and in the in the end they know that you're doing the right thing, then they appreciate it. Yeah. So behavior, you can try. But I think what you can achieve most is actually create the environment for the change of behavior to take place and encourage the openness for, uh, you know, people letting out their insecurities, you know. So the point about mental health is, is, is one of the things. If, if they are so stressed, how, how, how do they come to class and study? How do they, you know, and, and I'm not talking about mental health of students only, same thing with educators, same thing with people in administration. It's, it's an issue that is not often talked about and it's a lot of people view it as a sign of weakness. It's not weakness, it is what it is. But if you don't address, that's a sign of organizational weakness, I think. I hope that sort of addresses your question. Thank you, Mr. Wan, and thank you, Prof. Any other question? Yes. Well, we have been involved in education. We have been talking about education so much. Actually, if you go back into time immemorial, education started with the birth of mankind. Socrates, Confucius, and all these personalities in the yesteryears, those years, started education and uh, education was then defined as change in behavior. Perubahan tingkat laku. That is the main domain in education. But what do we mean by change in behavior means you are in a state where you are not a burden to the nation or the society. You can thrive in that society. That is how education uh, began. And today, what I notice, and I think we are always seeing one aspect, oh, the industry people want this, or oh, we want industrial revolution 4.0. That is one aspect. That is the end result. But what Due consideration is not given to the aspect of how this dem decimate, uh, decimation of skills and attitudes is being engrossed into the individual. The emphasis is on this part, not on that part. You can go to many educationists, they are great lecturers, you ask them, what's education? Uh, education. Uh, What's education? You ask them, uh, theories of conditioning, they don't know. You ask them a Pavlov's theory, they don't know. As you rightfully, your good self put it just now, or oh, I went and applied for a job to be a, a lecturer. We just saw my qualification. Okay, masuk, mengajar. Akan tetapi, apa yang jadi pada skill yang diperlukan? The skills are not emphasized. In fact, in 1991, there was this movement 
1991, whereby there were certain officers in the Ministry of Education wanted all lecturers, teachers, teachers had to do a postgrad uh, training for two years. That is, if they were from the A level starting point. But if they have already graduates, they had to go a minimum, uh, uh, a minimum of six months. And there was research done in 1995, where we found that the teachers that were being graduated, graduating from the 28 colleges in Malaysia were far more better than those who had six months education in the university post after their graduation. So my issue is, what is the take of your good self that emphasis is only given to one aspect, the requirements of industry, okay? But what about the other aspects? Things like, how do you get the cognitive skills encompassed in that student? Is due consideration given to that? How much of the retention time or attention time he has? I, for my readings, is about 24 to 28 minutes after your mind starts floundering. What is this aspect is not given due consideration. There is not a balancing act. So I just want your comments on that. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing that up. I mean, you come back to the basic question is, what is the purpose of education? And is it just to get jobs? No. Kalau kita tengok zaman dulu lah, you know, what our elders were saying, eh? the first thing they said about their kids is, Saya agak dia jadi orang. Right? That doesn't mean that they don't become animal or anything else lah. Orang lah kan. But that means, are they becoming good human beings? You know. I think even before Socrates, uh, you know, and his his peers, I think we, we know of Socrates and his peers is because there's a level record that has been uh, established. I think you know uh, this is time immemorial uh, that that this this sort of imparting of values uh, has to be there. So uh, I mean, it's, this is a this is a very interesting debate. I'd like to spend three days, three nights. We'll lock all you up in this room. We'll send some food inside once in a while and have this debate. It's fascinating. But my my take is this: yes. It is not all about jobs. Yes, it is about how do you create a better human being? But also, yes, how good are we as examples to the students? First and foremost, learning is a lot visually. They, they see who we are before what we teach. They look at our attitude before they listen to our words. And the same thing as parents, lah. Somewhere, lah. And if parents say, don't do this, but the parents, what? You're not showing by example. This whole topic of character. So I, 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 I wouldn't say behavior, but I'm, I'm not highly qualified within this field, so I, I, I wouldn't comment too much. But, you know, uh, one of the objective is to build character. I know for a fact in Islamic education, um, if you're a scholar of the olden days, the first two years is actually to build your adab. And adab is a very difficult word to translate, unfortunately. But it is, you know, the closest thing is to character. Because if you have the knowledge, but you don't have the adab, the tendency to misuse the knowledge is there. And this goes back to the uh, 
intent of education, you know. And and I think, uh, you know, I, I, I think your, your point that uh, learning and education is to change behavior is a valid one. Though I also think there are many other facets that we have to take into consideration. You know, uh, if you look at the Greeks, you know, it's it's mainly is how do you create a good citizen? I mean, the, some of the writings will actually uh, literally say, which translate to a good human being lah, jadi orang lah. And so education, yes, there are a skill part of education. Yes, I did emphasize on that because that is one of the things that we're doing. But we have this whole team in uh, EduCity that we call EduCity Experience. And that is meant to address the non-technical knowledge part in bringing somebody through the journey of education. Because in my opinion, um, when do people form opinions? To me, when you are starting to have a little bit of freedom around 16, 17, but when you really concretize it, is in your tertiary years. And the, for the responsibility of educators in impacting a student in how they form their opinion, and it's not for us to spoon feed them, it's not for us to enforce our opinion on them. You know, for me, if, if I want to, after having worked for like almost 30 years, 20, 25, 30 years, is from an educational perspective, are we teaching them or are they learning how to learn? Because once, and I've changed five different industries. I've been in 13 different jobs. The architectural knowledge that I have of five years of education actually sharpened my senses to how do I learn new things? And how do I become you know, a useful person in the organization or in the community that I'm in? So I'd love to take you up on, on probably a different platform. Pasal nanti semua orang komplain tak nak balik rumah. Nanti orang dia orang tutup lampu cakap, hmm, mamak ni tak habis-habis nak cakap. Yeah. Yeah. Food, I am not sponsoring food by the way. <laughs> but it is an important question and it is an important discussion which I hope you guys will bring up in your series as well. I hope that partially answers your question. Thank you, Mr. One, one last question, Mr. Matthew. After that, I have one question. Okay, here we go. Hi, uh, just a quick one. Um, how do you nurture your industry relationships? How do you get them? They they add value to you. How do you add value to them? That's a really, very good question. Yeah, excellent question. Uh, w i i f m. That's what industries understand. What's in it for me? And, but it's not just the industry. Anybody is what's in it for me. I mean, how, how, what do you contribute? Uh, um, so I think you have to be uh, very clear about what, what value you have. You know, I, I, I found an extremely enlightened industry uh, I mean, uh, head of a company before. Because he said, when I want to innovate, I look for the best research done by the universities around me, I go and I pattern and I actually work with them and do that. That is super, super rare in the industry. I think as with industry or as with any other problem, number one is understanding the problem. This one also like consultant, you know, same thing. First, do we understand the issue? And number two, do we have a contribution in solving that issue? And then they will listen. And we have to know that there are issues that we can't solve for them. And that is better for somebody else to solve for them. Fine. But you know you have a certain value, you have a certain knowledge, you have a certain background that absolutely addresses that issue. So you have to show your value. When I talk, uh, tell, talk to my team, I actually said, don't sell products. Initiate solutions. If you solve somebody's problem, they're going to keep coming back to you. 
Yeah. The the slightly cruder way to say is if you help make them look good as well, and this is human uh, human character, they'll keep coming back to you. You know, how can I champion what they want to achieve and help them achieve it? And if you help them achieve, it doesn't matter whether you get a name or whatever, but if you help them achieve, they'll keep coming back to you. And sometimes, I mean, Dr. Sakina and I sometimes are in a huge predicament. Once you have helped them with the solution and the sense of trust takes place, then you have a huge problem. They keep coming back to you and you don't know whether you have enough hands and feet to actually help them fulfill. But that's a good problem, isn't it? You know, but the first thing is, can you help them solve with a solution? And can you gain trust? Once you have a solution and you have trust, the rest is easy. But we, we target what we, we know we can achieve. Lah. And we, we target what we is within our field of expertise. But the problem with Dr. Sakina and I, we just sell first, think of solution later. Ah, that one dangerous also lah. You know. But when the trust is there, they will come to you with everything and want you to help them solve. And, and I tell you, it's one of the most sweetest experiences in the world when you can help somebody solve a problem. And if you are a good problem solver, they will keep coming back to you. I'm, I'm, my job over the last 13 jobs has been most of the time problem solver lah, because I always get thrown the problem projects. Lah. Okay, this one, uh, my first job was, oh, this normally takes two months, but we've only got two weeks. First job, eh? fresh. I didn't go home for the next two weeks, except to take a shower. And my mother thought she lost a son. She just saw a stranger come in every morning to take a shower. But if you have the spirit, the dedication, and the perseverance to help solve the problem, it gets solved. That's why I love the, I love the uh, saying, it's only impossible until you do it. And a lot of things look impossible until you do it then it was never really impossible, was it? So you want industry help? Listen. And, and, and so many things you can learn from consultants, seriously. Consultants are the best listeners. Uh, I will give you uh, an example where I worked with five consulting companies and I was a client. And, uh, you know, and this was a HR issue. Four of them were HR consultants, one of, uh, no, no, three were HR consultants, two were not. So the three HR consultants, uh, we had a meeting. They said, okay, I understand your requirements. I'll come back with a, a proposal in two weeks. One uh, of the non-HR consulting had two, two meetings uh, extra. And then they said, okay, uh, I've got enough data. I'll come back to you in two weeks. But there's one consulting company spent 10 meetings with us at their own cost, brought their experts around the world to talk to us. By the 10th, after the 10th meeting, they knew exactly what the problem was and they knew exactly the attitude that we had to the problem, such that when the proposal came, it was as if you were speaking the solution. Listen, process, and then impart your value gain the trust. Once you gain the trust, it becomes a lot easier from my experience. Hope that helps. Thank you, Mr. Wan and Mr. Matthew. There's one last question. Uh, during your presentation about your uh, Educity Skender, the, the new project which you are going to launch is to close the gap between the academic and the uh, industry. You have said there are different of uh, pedagogical approaches there, but for this closing this, what is your approach? Maybe you can share with us, which can help us in our uh, academic transformation also. Okay. I think um, 
you got to get close to industry lah and how you know i i mentioned a little bit about them but um so how do we get close to industry one is by coincidence the other then is by uh conscious effort coincidence is because i have a huge sports complex covid time nobody went to it and suddenly an opportunity became for it to become a pikas ppv center and suddenly 430 factories had 30600 doses administered to their staff and suddenly my team got to know the hr managers of 430 companies and because the relationship was good then they started asking us hey, can you help us with this huh? so in this case that was the unconscious but the conscious part is how do you treat them how do you uh, interact with them you know how do you make things easy for them how do you solve their problems they had a problem they had thousands of people to be vaccinated and you help solve once you help solve problems and then they will come to you and say hey, you have training programs right you have you know now now there's a magic word in the academic world that industry loves now which is micro credentials you have bite sized learning that leads to academic qualification make full use of that you know learning so that the people you can upskill those people at work without them committing to a lot of time from work and that you know and 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 in reality in any uh, person's career if you only have a diploma you hit a ceiling right you want to become manager difficult whatever the company say lah our we have open policy whatever but once if you you only at a certain academic level you hit a ceiling so micro credentials can help them upgrade and if you assist them in upgrading they'll keep coming back to you because you help them yes we are working on that we have already have micro credential now we are working on the dbet programs also something excellent the skills of upskilling the skills for the our staffs and other people also okay thank you mr one uh, i think we can end this question it's already yes. well over the time uh, it's not tomorrow yet so <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Aida, for giving me the opportunity. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Prof. Thank you, Mr. Bonamad. Uh, as we are coming to the end of the session, I would like to invite Associate Professor Alo, Chief Operating Officer of Masla Group of Academic Institutions, to give us his uh, closing remarks. Thank you. Good evening, Prof. Dr. Dr. Ikram, <coughs> Associate uh, Prof. Dr. Veronica, Prof. Dr. Gopal, and uh, Mr. Wan Ahmad, and Prof. Dr. Sakina. Thank you for being with us and the colleagues. Wow, uh, that was a wonderful session. Do you all agree with me? Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Bon, uh, for uh, spending time with us. All of us, uh, since we used to the same environment, we forgot uh, one one thing is what is AAE? So it is our Academic Affairs and the Equal Committee. Equal is uh, taking care of regulatory committee who is uh, uh, working with uh, various faculties who looks after our Academic Affairs. This is for you, Mr. Bon, because you will be wondering what is AAE. Yeah, um, so the, the, that's our, uh, that's uh, being managed by our Prof. Uh, Veronica and Professor Gopal. Um, this is yet another wonderful topic, dear colleagues. Um, every week, every month, we are having uh, this uh, wonderful opportunity to meet um, some of excellent talent um, within the country, like Mr. Uh, Mr. Wan today with us, and a couple of weeks ago. Mr. Chris was here, who was talking about um, the industry collaboration. Please join us and make use of uh, um, the experience and expertise that they 
years of experience that they bring it here and share sharing with us. Uh, Mr. Wan, uh, you are probably 300 kilometers away from us in the workplace means, but the ideas and everything that you share is most of the thing. I don't know, like we are colonial cousins or something. We, we keep talking about the same thing. Every topic that you mentioned here, including the industry collaborations and, and the academic values and the education and everything. Those who are with us uh, in our um, board meetings and all, they do hear the same thing. And uh, uh, we, we love to hear more from you. And uh, I was talking to the Torani uh, also, even before you, uh, you, 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 you arrived here, he was talking about the experience that he shared with you. So um, I requested him to have more uh, sessions, both formal, informal, and non-formal sessions with you. So, so that we have something to move on together. And thank you very much once again, dear colleagues. I'll see you again in the next week. Thank you, Mr. Warnick. Thank you, Associate Professor Hello, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, as we come to the end of the session, on behalf of uh, Academic Affairs and Equal Committee, I would like to thank you again for coming to this event. It's much appreciated. And I hope you all stay safe and well. Thank you so much.